I'm going to discuss HR 357 briefly, and I have a, I do have a question. Are we going to do a separate panel for HR 6570, or is this, is this the same panel? Basically, separate. Separate but equal. Well, 350, HR 357, a little bit different topic uh, than 6570. But, um, yeah, so HR 357 will increase the accountability of policymakers in the executive branch. As we all know, the exec executive branch promulgates regulations that far exceed the number of laws passed by Congress in any given year. In 2022, this disparity was 3,168 regulations issued by agencies compared to 247 laws passed by Congress. This astonishing statistic illustrates how much federal law comes from unelected officials in the administrative state instead of Congress. And under current law, some of the bureaucrats who initiate, enact, and enforce regulations lack direct political accountability. For example, one analysis found that more than 70% of regulations issued by the Department of Health and Human Services between 2001 and 2017 were issued by career employees. And at the FDA, it was more than 98% over the same period. This is not representative government working as it should. H.R. 357 would remedy this by generally requiring that only politically accountable officials, not career bureaucrats, initiate and issue regulations. This bill will increase political accountability and federal policymaking and restore the right of the American people to choose who governs them. I remember one of the most, uh, two, two important things that I, that I learned when I came in. When I went into one of the U.S. Senators' office for a visit and a briefing, he showed me the stack of bills passed by Congress, and it was like four inches high. And during the same 12-month period, he showed me the stack of regulations promulgated by our federal agencies and bureaucracies, and that was over 12 feet high. And I, uh, I, that stark reminder has never left me. The second thing is um, the amount of actual criminal uh, regulations that come out, not, not that they're criminal, but criminally enforcing uh, regulations that come out is also overwhelming coming from the regulatory agencies as opposed from this august body, and I think that's backwards too. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I urge the, the, the adoption and uh, a moving H.R. 357 to the floor. And I yield back. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yes, I am. I am, but I. Okay, all right. I, I'm. I am prepared to go with 6570. Thank you. I, I will be a little bit longer um, on 6570 if that's all right, Mr. Chairman. Um, last week, the Judiciary Committee favorably reported this bill by a vote of 35 to two. Oh, this bill has overwhelming bipartisan, bicameral support. The overwhelming nature of the vote was the result of months of bipartisan negotiations, and this bill makes the most robust improvements to the. Uh, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act since its inception in 1978. I am grateful to have been able to introduce this important piece of legislation with my colleague, uh, the ranking member, Mr. Nadler, who's here just in the nick of time. So brief history for, for those, uh, just as it w might serve as just a, a reminder. FISA was enacted in 1979 in response to the revelation that the federal government had seriously abused its intelligence authorities and violated Americans' civil liberties through warrantless surveillances. Unfortunately, the federal government has similarly abused FISA and continues to use its broad powers to improperly spy on American citizens. Whether it was FBI Director Ray telling Congress that we should not, quote, lose any sleep over FISA applications, or former Director Comey calling FISA a top-tier FBI program, the government has insisted that we should should not worry about warrantless surveillance. However, as we've seen in recent years, the intelligence community and the FBI have repeatedly fallen short of respecting the civil liberties of Americans. Department of Justice Inspector General Michael Horowitz has released several reports showing how the FBI violated its authorities and improperly spied on Americans. Inspector General Horowitz's audits and investigations found that the FBI was plagued by, quote, systemic noncompliance, close quote with its internal procedures designed to ensure accuracy. 
Special Counsel John Durham released a report earlier this year on the FBI's Crossfire Hurricane investigation where he not only bolstered I.G. Horowitz's findings, but also found that political and confirmation bias led the FBI to lie, actually lie, to the Fisk, uh, uh, the Fisk Court in order to improperly spy on the Trump campaign. So when I say Fisk, I'm, I'm, that's referring to FISA Court. The government has taken a tool designed to collect foreign intelligence and prevent terrorist attacks and has used it as a domestic spy apparatus. In 2021, the FBI queried the communications of more than 3.3 million U.S. persons. They queried more than 3.3 million U.S. persons. In 2022, the FBI was still conducting hundreds of U.S. persons queries per day. A recent FISA court opinion revealed that in recent years, the FBI conducted more than 278,000 improper searches of U.S. persons communications. The FBI imp improperly queried a member of the House, a United States Senator, a state Senator, and, and a state judge, all without following their own internal proper procedures. The FBI searched the communications of more than 19,000 donors to a congressional campaign. Why? The FBI stated is that stated reason was that they wanted to know if the donors were being influenced by foreign adversaries. And on that point, I will come back to that point, because, and I, I want you to remember that rationale. We have to look at the U.S. persons illegally because we want to determine whether the Fed, they were in, uh, influenced by foreign adversaries. The FBI queried the names of hundreds of those present at the Capitol on January 6, 2021, and hundreds of individuals present at the George Floyd protest in 2020. The FBI even queried those who came to its own offices, the FBI's own offices, to do things like conduct repairs, give reports. Victims of, they were victims of crimes and individuals that were providing tips to the FBI. To other agencies, just for one, I'll just give you one example of another agency problem. An NSA analyst searched individuals that the analyst was meeting through online dating services. That's, that just gives you a history of the, of, of the abuses. So for many years, many of us have been trying to reform FISA. We thought the holy grail would be if you could just get under 702, a warrant requirement, when incidental um, US persons were queried in a foreign person, foreign land database. That is what many of us have been working on for a long time. Many months ago, the Republican side of the House formed a task force, judiciary and intelligence members. I was the, the lead for the Judiciary Committee. We met regularly with the Intel Committee. We actually came up with some areas that we had agreement on. In the meantime, literally for years, outside NGOs and interested parties, from the ACLU to the American First uh, Policy Institute, began working on reform. And many of those reforms are actually in the Judiciary Bill. In the meantime, literally for years, the Judiciary Committee has been having regular multiple hearings on reforms. We actually had multiple reform hearings this year and I view those as a continuation of everything from meeting with DOJ IG Horowitz, the Special Counsel Durham, and other interested parties who came in multiple times to testify. Meetings were held with the FBI officials. I personally attended at least three of those meetings, one of which where they gave us a classified briefing on their purported reforms to prevent the type of abuses that they have engaged in over time. We had our judiciary markup last Wednesday, came out 35 to 2, the Intel Committee. Theirs came out, I don't know what theirs came out. But violations such as the ones we've discussed make clear the need for reform. But the FBI and intelligence agencies try, have tried to scare Congress. They're trying to convince, they, who runs a better disinformation campaign than the intelligence community? And they're running one on this bill. They are trying to dissuade people 
and misrepresent what this bill does. The reality is we can protect our country and respect American civil liberties. The, the, this bill, the Protect Liberty and End Warrantless Surveillance Act, ensures that the intelligence community can continue to collect foreign intelligence information and keep Americans free from harm while enacting necessary reforms to protect Americans from warrantless surveillance. This bill requires all intelligence agencies and the FBI to obtain a warrant from the FISC before conducting a query of a U.S. person. This warrant requirement includes exceptions for emergency situations when the subject of a query consents to the search or when defending against a cybersecurity attack. The bill significantly, re significantly reduces the number of FBI personnel authorized to conduct search queries. That's something that both HIPSI and ju Judiciary agreed on. This bill requires surveillance applications to include robust accuracy procedures, expands the ability of Miki Curiae to participate in proceedings at the FISC and allows certain members of Congress to attend FISC proceedings, increasing Congress's oversight over the court. The other bill does not do those things. This bill is designed to protect Americans' rights and allow for our intelligence community to gather data from uh, um, foreign adversaries in a timely fashion. We've provided exceptions. We've provided exceptions there to the warrant requirement. This bill also includes enhanced transparency measures and ensures that those who violate the civil liberties of Americans will be held accountable for their actions. We agreed with HIPSI on the penalties, both criminal and civil. But I will tell you that in the very first provision, Section 101 of the HIPSI bill, you negate all of those punitive protections. Why? Because you have put, and in Section 504 as well of their bill, you have put so many, um, uh, expanded the ability to search so many people and query so many people that nobody was going to be uh, subject to these penalties. Let's give you an example. In Section 101, which is kind of the keynote of what they're doing, of their bill, they say they're going to get rid of the, the, the criminal-only searches. Well, out of 200,000 searches they did last year, do you know how many fit that rubric? Two. That's not a reform. That's, that's merely window dressing to suggest that they're doing something. Our bill also closes the data broker loophole to ensure that the government cannot make an end run around the Fourth Amendment to purchase the data of Americans. That passed out of judiciary unanimously. Unanimously. And quite frankly, Section 504 attacks that, that provision as well. Section 504 of the other bill. That attacks that bill. Why? Because what they're doing under Section 504 is they are they're basically saying, we're going to now, instead of, of, of working with these major big companies like that have the ability, they have the software and all of the communications equipment, we're going to expand that. And by their expansion, what that does is it says, it's, it, you, you broaden it so greatly that if you're a small business or a medium-sized business, you're going to, if, if, you're, if you're the Starbucks that offers Wi-Fi, you're going to have to either stop offering Wi-Fi or reconfigure your system so you can provide to the federal government our data. You're going to have to do new hardware, new software. That's what their bill does. It's, it's, um, it's not really providing reforms. And the reason I'm, I'm spending time on that is because I don't think I'm going to have an opportunity to actually directly engage with my friends um, on that bill coming up. So when the FRRA says um, that they're going to um, limit abuses, and yet they expand the number of people and the equipment that's going to be necessary, they actually undermine the punitive measures that we take in place, and the warrant requirement. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to ask that you would accept a piece by uh, a, a, an attorney named Gene Scher called the Trojan Horse in the House Intelligence Bill would force your baristas to spy on you. I'm you're, going to end. asking you to have consent to place that in the record? Yes, please. 
without objection, so ordered. And I'll do the same for a piece by one of the current amici at the, at the FISA court, Mark Zwillinger, and his, is in, his, his article is entitled House Intelligence Committee FISA Reform Bill would greatly expand the class of businesses and other entities required to assist in FISA 702 surveillance. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. So, I've, I've hit on Section 101. I'm, I'm just going to try to reiterate just a couple of points without trying to belabor it, because I don't, I, I don't want to insult your intelligence, but I want to make sure it's clear. FRRA is in no sense a genuine reform unless your idea of reform is not to decrease warrantless spying on Americans, but rather to increase spying on Americans by the intel community with no accountability. And in so doing, changing uh, and the and negating, quite frankly, the punitive measures that we have put in place in both our bill and HIPSI. Section 101 of their bill, which we can assume is a signature reform, they think, is to prohibit, quote, evidence of a crime-only query. And as I mentioned, it would only have affected two of 200,000 queries. Less than one one-thousandth of one percent of their queries would have even been affected by this last year. Immediately also, because of the exceptions that they put in there, the FBI can claim in every case that it is also looking for some terror threat or avail itself of the two immediate exceptions provided by the FRRA. The abuses that I have previously detailed would not be eliminated. eliminated. Next is Section 504 of FRRA. This provision requires that anyone who has access to any, quote, Equipment that is being or may be used to transmit or store such communications, close quote, must or shall be treated as, quote, electronic communication service providers, close quote. That's what we mean. It spreads it out, and now everybody's an electronic communication service provider, and therefore you fall and you get swept up in seven, Section 702's general requirement to disclose Americans' personal communication data to the government. We will not be given notice that our information has been transferred, transferred to the government. So right now you have big companies like Google, Facebook, Meta, Microsoft, and telecom giants like T-Mobile, AT&T, and, Ver and Verizon. They're swept up in Section 702 because they have that equipment, that, that, that category. They fit the definition. Those communications to telecom companies already get foreign data uh, about foreign per people to, federal, to the feds. But of course, Americans get inc incidentally caught up in that. But the FRRA expansion, which includes equipment, would cover small and medium-sized businesses that store data or provide Wi-Fi, a business landlord, Airbnb host, coffee shops, the airport where you go and you sign in. They would all have now a legal obligation because they'd been re to reconfigure their gear to give to government emails, texts, or phone metadata, or they're going to have to stop offering that, those services. Big data centers as well will also have legal obligations to, supp to supply the government. Some analysts have called this, as I've get, as a referenced in one piece, a Trojan horse. My colleagues on the other side have also said that narco trafficking, we will not be able to follow narco trafficking, um, and that they're putting something in. But that's a cosmetic change by creating a superfluous, unnecessary category in order to look like it's cracking down on narco-traffickers. And I will, at some point, if I can find, I brought a whole bunch of junk so I can submit to you um, to rebut what my colleagues say. But the point is, there are already authorities that exist now to follow narco-trafficking. In fact, they do follow narco-traffickers. And, uh, and I will submit that, that document in, in a moment. As some analysts have con concluded, this bill is an, the intelligence community's dream of expanded spying, <coughs> provisions that nullify civil and criminal punishments for abusive spying, codification, codification of ineffective or remedial measures taken by the FBI and, FBI and IC, and broadening the scope of soon-to-be-conducted warrantless incid incidental searches or queries of Americans. It is their deceptive provisions. This all comes with an eight-year an eight-year sunset provision. They want this to be extended longer than we've ever seen a Section 702 sunset provision be extended. 
<clears throat> and in the DC bubble, it is always de rigueur to accept or provide special treatment for members of Congress. The FRRA is no exception. It requires the FBI to get consent before it conducts a, a um, defensive query or search for a member of Congress. And that means all of your communications, texts, emails, phone calls. So they're going to give you a defensive briefing. But no other American's going to get that. No other American's going to get that. It's just us. The Judiciary Bill requires exculpatory evidence to be presented to the FISC when, title one, when a Title I court order is sought by the intelligence community. You, this is the Carter Page issue. And the others, and the Hipsy Bill, they say, oh, we take care of the Carter Page issue. They don't. Because they say, if there's exculpatory evidence, the agency will give it to the Attorney General. And the Attorney General will decide whether they disclose the exculpatory evidence to the FISC. Do you think Carter Page would have happened under the, their version? The answer is yes. Because the, the AG is a, like it or not, under whichever side you're on, they have some political in, in, intuition. The Hipsy bill limits that notification. So my point is there is much to talk about here to go head to head. I think our bill deals with so many of these things. It's been an honor to work with my, my uh, colleagues across the aisle. Um, uh, Ranking Member Nadler, former Chairman of Judiciary Nadler, uh, has been a key on this. Uh, Zoe Lofgren, uh, Pramila Jayapal, and a whole host of our colleagues across the aisle have joined us in advancing this bill. And uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I will be happy to answer any questions that you may have, but I'll yield back.